Hi, I'm Nick Cameron. Uh, I'm part of the async working group. And in this talk, I'm going to talk about asynchronous programming in Rust. So in particular, I want to you know, chart a course from uh, the, how, how the, the current async um, system was designed, and in particular, like the, the design pressures that led to the design decisions that have led to where we are today, and some of the some things that are good and some of the things that are not so good about the current system. I also want to talk about the, the work that the Async Working Group is doing to make things better and push us kind of into a shiny future where everything is great with async programming. So very quickly, just to kind of like fill you in on what you can do today if you're not aware, um, async and await are keywords and they are stable. They've been stable since 2018. And so you can do asynchronous programming in Rust today. Um, however, there is minimal support in the standard library for it. And uh, and frankly, kind of like the support of the language is somewhat minimal too. Um, and we're we're really relying on the, the ecosystem um, to, to fill in a lot of the gaps there. But the async working group is well working, um, and we're we're trying to make things better. So let's go way back in time and put up and um, think about how um, things were were designed. So. Uh, to, to reflect on some of these kind of design pressures, uh, some of the requirements that led to the design, I want to think about what makes Rust unique, what makes Rust Rust. And I, I often come back to this kind of like fundamental trifecta of, uh, of things we want Rust to achieve. So safety, super important, um, performance, and ergonomics. And you get to choose three in Rust, okay? That's our, that's our real offering. So let's... Let's dig into that performance a little bit because performance is really important. It's one of the big motivators for, for async programming. And performance can mean a lot of things in a lot of places. And we don't just care about making your program kind of like incrementally faster over what you could achieve in, in other languages. And we don't care just about kind of like the, the difference between an algorithm which takes kind of days versus minutes to run, right? We care potentially about every single byte of memory, every single cycle of the of the CPU. And we want to give you, the Rust programmer, precise control over what your program is doing because you are the one who decides which bytes and which cycles actually matter. Okay. Now a consequence of these kind of like you know fundamental goals of Rust, we've got a few kind of design principles. The first one um, that often comes up is this idea of zero cost abstractions. This was in this is a design principle that we've inherited from C. And this doesn't mean that your abstractions are free. Uh, that's not how it works. What it means is that if you don't use an abstraction, then you don't pay for it. And furthermore, if you do use it, it will be basically the same cost as if you had done a well-crafted version by hand. A similar idea, similar-ish, is um, related to this idea of precise control of performance is about this aversion to magic. You'll often hear kind of like people talking disparagingly about a, a proposed feature feeling too magical. And I think kind of like a better way to, to explain this idea is that it's imp if, you, if you want to have precise control over what your program is doing, you have to understand how the compiler is compiling your program, or at least be able to understand that at a, at a high level. Um, another design principle, not so related to these others, but I think it's really important to understand where, where the design for async Rust came from, is this idea of providing the fundamentals. Uh, Rust is not about minimalism. We, you know, there's, there's a string abstraction in the standard library and a hash map. Um, but we don't provide much more than the fundamentals. And, and in particular, we don't want to dictate to you like the high level architecture of your um, program by having a really kind of like a pen opinionated point of view on um, kind of like concurrency architectures or, or what have you. We, we, we somewhat deliberately leave that to the kind of like ecosystem so that you can have kind of like libraries for things like actors, but you don't force everyone to use an actor model. Okay, so um, looking at the design, 
probably like the, the really most fundamental thing about designing an asynchronous programming system is whether you have a model based on green threads or on um, we call stackless coroutines. And these are both kind of jargony names. I'm going to explain both of these things. So green threads are like mini operating system threads. Okay, so the programming language provides a runtime, and this does everything that the, the operating system would do for, for operating system threads. So it's got a scheduler, it's got context switching, um, and, and so on. And this is fairly kind of like a heavyweight runtime. And the programming model for the programmer is pretty similar to using operating threads. You might have kind of like some kind of spawn construct, but other than that, there's very little syntactic overhead. And you basically pretend that you're using operating system threads, um, except things are a little bit more performant because you don't have to keep going through the, the operating system to context switch or what have you. Um, the alternative is to build a system around kind of like async and await. This is the so-called um, coroutines model, where you, you have this syntactic overhead the, of async and await. The, the programmer is explicitly aware about these things. But they are compile, compiled down um, to, to, um, to just regular um, uh, machine code. Um, and so at runtime, there's uh, the, the um, there, there's very little little overhead. And we'll talk in a bit more detail about that, how that works, because this is obviously where we've ended up. Now, Rust, back in the day, way before 1.0, Rust used to have a, a green threads model. Um, but this didn't fit with um, those design principles that I talked about earlier. In particular, it was not a zero cost abstraction, because Everyone, if, if you're using green threads, then um, then everyone is in this green threads world, right? And um, there's there's a lot of downsides to that. In particular, like the the view that you have um, in your Rust code of the of what's a thread and and how how your programming ex is executing is very different from what other programming languages or or what you would see from the point of view of another programming language or from the operating system. And that introduces a whole bunch of friction and therefore performance penalty when you are interacting between Rust and other programming uh, and programs written in other languages. And furthermore, this mismatch between kind of like um, Rust's idea of a thread and everyone else's idea of a thread um, really becomes important with uh, when you block the thread. And as a consequence of this, it's basically impossible to write like a high quality, low level IO library uh, using the green threads model. And so this the, the green thread system in Rust was ripped out um, before 1.0. And with the idea that kind of like we would later develop a system based around async await. And so I, I said that when we've got this async await system, that is compiled down into kind of like regular code. And in Rust, that regular code is futures. So a future is just a regular Rust data type, any da data type, as long as it implements the future trait. And the future trait is pretty simple. It just has a single um, method, poll, and um, the, the user or the runtime makes progress by calling the poll function. So the, the future itself just totally inerts, just a, a, a regular piece of data. Um, and execution happens by repeatedly calling the poll function. And you can imagine that if you have multiple futures and a runtime um, uh, schedules kind of execution by calling this poll function in sequence, then you get um, kind of concurrent but not parallel execution of these futures. Okay, so if that's how um, futures can give you this concurrency, how do we get from async and await to futures? Well, well, let's look at that translation. Let's start by looking at um, how we deal with the async keyword. So an async function um, is uh, is lowered to just a regular function that returns a future. 
And if we look at the, the type here, we use an infiltrate type because we don't care what the precise type is. In fact, that precise type is kind of unknown other than to the compiler. Um, but we do care that it implements this future trait. And that's all the infiltrate um, uh, type tells us. So that's perfect. Uh, now, if we actually think about like the semantics of this, when we call an async function, we're just going to get a future back. And as I said, a future is just a totally inert piece of data. And that's why um, you have to await or poll that future to actually make progress, which can be a bit surprising if you're used to kind of like async functions and other languages which start making progress as soon as you call them. Now, if you can have async functions, it's like a natural step to then want to have async methods and traits. Um, and, and unfortunately, this is not supported in Rust at the moment, and it's one of the like most kind of like in demand features, right? So let's I'll try and explain why this is uh, trickier than than regular async functions. So let's look at that um, that translation step. So we would just do the same translation, and the the semantics of returning a future is super easy, but the type here, well, the type is we've got this impl trait type in a, on a trait method. And unfortunately, that's not supported in Rust. This feature is called re return position infiltrate in trait. And I'm not even going to tr try and pronounce that acronym because only a frog could do that. Um, but uh, the good news is that uh, this feature, like implement implementation of this feature, is way underway. There's like lots of the parts of it in. Um, in the compiler, which is what we care about uh, for, for async functions, for async methods. Uh, and this is going to be available to, to use for everybody pretty soon, I hope. Now, the way that um, return position infiltrate and trait is implemented is that the return type becomes an associated type. And this is really important because this means that uh, different implementations of the trait um, can have different concrete types for the async function. And that allows you to have different implementations, which after all is the whole point of having like a trait in the first place. So that's really important. There's a wrinkle here in that if you have a generic function um, or you use a lifetime from self or one of the other arguments in the future, and this is super common without you really noticing um, in, in, in async functions, then you need the generic associated type, uh, which we abbreviate as GATS. Um, and again, this is another feature that's not fully implemented. This one's a little bit further ahead. You can actually use this on unstable Rust, um, and we're, we're talking about stabilization at the moment. What's important for the async, futures, uh, async methods work is that it is implemented in the compiler. So um, with these two features, return position, impulse trait, and trait, and generic um, associated types, we're really close to being able to support asynchronous functions in uh, asynchronous methods and traits. And so that's something that should ship in the very near future. It gets even more complicated than that because we often want to call asynchronous functions on trait objects, and that is not something that would be supported with this translation. Um, so the, the working group is um, looking at, at doing that, I won't dive into the details here, but that, that works underway too. Okay, so we've talked about translating async. How about await? Await is a little bit more complicated. I'm going to go into that in, in depth in this talk. Um, await is a, um, a signal to the compiler that you can split the, the function here into futures, and then you can stitch all those futures together into a state machine, and um, the run um, the, the asynchronous runtime can then poll that state machine to, to make progress, and, and in turn, that's going to poll these individual futures, um, which uh, where the future here um, will probably come from being an asynchronous function. As I said, it's a bit complicated. We only need to, to kind of like understand this in depth. What's important is that it's a future that's being awaited. And one thing that the asynchronous working group has looked at is um, making that uh, more flexible. And the way we do that is with an into future trait. So, uh, I want to talk by analogy about into iterator first. So into iterator is a trait that says this is a, um, a data type that is iteratable, and here's a way to get an iterator over it. 
And this is implemented by things like VEC, by Borrowed Slice, by many collections. And so, and it's used in the, um, the implementation of the for loop. So when you write a for loop like this, the thing that you can kind of iterate over in the for loop doesn't have to be an iterator. Um, it can be like anything that's iterable, iteratable by using an iterator. And trivially, that includes iterators themselves, right? But it also includes VEX and slices and so on and so forth. And it's this, the same thing with futures. We have this interfuture trait now, um, which is anything that can be converted into a future. And now when we call a wait, it doesn't have to be a future on the left-hand side of that. It can be anything that can be converted into a future. And this makes a number of programming patterns just a bit more ergonomic. So here's an example of using an async builder. So like the kind of really common builder pattern, um, this is a replacement for kind of complicated constructors where we call kind of like property methods to initialize the builder. And the and the, the nice thing here is that we can then just await the builder itself. We don't need to have kind of an explicit step to convert it into a future before we await it. Okay, so just kind of like changing tack a little bit now. Um, so we talked about how um, we go from async functions to futures, and then we um, poll the future to, to make progress. Okay, and after not, after we've polled it a few times, we'll have met the future will hopefully make progress and return a result to the um, uh, to the to the, uh, to to the caller of the future. What happens if you just well stop polling? Um, in particular, if you drop. If you if you poll a future or even don't poll it at all, you just drop it, um, or you poll it for a bit and then drop it, um, then well, as I said before, this is just an inert data type. There's the there's no execution that's going to carry on. Um, the uh, the future is cancelled, and cancellation is a really useful thing to do. And in fact, like having cancellation so easily like linked to drop. Um, is really nice as well because it means you never need to worry about like zombie futures who are just progressing in the background with no way for you to get the result of them. And we make use of this in macro in um, features like the select macro, which is going to drop um, futures that it, we don't care about and to to cancel them. And that's really kind of like a clean way for it to tidy up the, um, the these futures. But it comes with some problems too. Um, and again, these can be somewhat surprising, especially if you're used to um, uh, asynchronous programming in another language. So consider a future which, when it's polled, it is going to make some progress and it's going to write that progress to um, an internal buffer. And when it's made enough progress, when it's done, it's going to return the contents of that buffer to the user. Well, this is fine. This is kind of a use case you can imagine to futures. It's a perfectly great thing to do, um, unless that future gets cancelled. And if the future gets cancelled, then this data we've written into the intermediate buffer is just going to be lost, gone. Um, and data loss is generally pretty bad. You generally want to avoid this. So you have to be really careful. And so you have to reason um, about this idea of kind of like cancellation safety for your futures. Is this, a, is this a future that can get canceled? Is something bad going to happen if it does get canceled and so forth? And this is a bit of a foot gun um, for, for asynchronous programmers. And it's something the working group has spent a lot of time kind of thinking about, thinking, can we do better? Um, and another place that this idea of cancellation um, causes issues is with completion IO. Um, so this is about designing the async I.O. traits. So that's kind of like async read, async write traits. Um, and completion I.O. is, it's kind of the new hotness at the moment because I.O. U-Ring on, on Linux uses a completion model and is pretty awesome. Um, less fashionably, it's also the default way to do um, asynchronous I.O. on Windows using I.O.C.P. The way completion IO works is pretty intuitive, actually. Um, so the user initiates a read uh, with some call to kind of like a um, into the operating system, and you pass in a buffer to the operating system. 
And then you, the, the user can get on with something else, right? It's asynchronous I.O. after all. And at some point further on in time, the, the, the I.O. is going to be done and the OS somehow notifies the user that um, the I.O. is complete. And at that point, the user can look at the, its buffer and lo and behold, the data will be there to read. Now, there's some interesting invariants about this buffer. Okay, so the, the buffer is supplied by the user, but the user must um, guarantee that that buffer stays alive and that the OS has unique access to that buffer for the entire duration of that I.O. Right. Now, um, this actually fits really well with kind of some of the core concepts of kind of like borrowing in Rust and um, uh, wrapping all that stuff up in an async function. So the way that this would work in Rust is that um, you've got your buffer here, we're just going to allocate it locally on the on the stack, and then you call read and you're going to pass a mutable reference to that buffer and that's unique, and then you're going to await the result. And Rust guarantees that, that buffer is not going to be used by anyone else and it guarantees that it's going to live until um, uh, after that read call completes. So this is fantastic. This just very naturally maps onto this like quite kind of like subtle invariant that completion IO requires. Unfortunately, it doesn't work so well in the presence of cancellation. So if we take the, 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 the future, remember this asynchronous function is just returning a future and we just drop it or even worse, we call mem forget. Um, and yeah, this is a silly thing to do, but it's probably actually wrapped up in a select macro or something similar to that. So this does actually happen in real life. Well, what happens now? What happens is that the future is cancelled, um, which means it's dropped, um, which means that the buffer is deallocated. And that's safe to do because we've reached the, we're, we're never going to call um, the, the poll function that's underlying these things again. So that buffer's never going to get used. Unfortunately, the operating system doesn't know that the read has been cancelled. As far as the operating system is concerned, we still want that I.O. to happen, and it still thinks it has unique access to that buffer, and so it's going to read into that buffer, um, and that's going to be a use after free error, and we hate those in Rust. We try really hard not to have use after free errors. All right, well, why can't you just cancel the read with the operating system? And you can do that. Um, most completion systems allow you some way to, to, to cancel the I.O. Um, the, unfortunately, cancellation is asynchronous too. And the invariant around cancellation is that you have to ensure that that um, buffer lives as well, uh, until either the cancellation or the original read completes. Okay, And, and we can't do that, right? We... Um, we, we, we don't have kind of any facility for, gar for calling um, an asynchronous um, uh, function when uh, a, a future gets cancelled. Okay, well, um, what about having async drop? Uh, would that solve the problem? Well, for one thing, async drop is turns out to be really complicated. Um, although it's kind of simple to explain, that it's, it's kind of complicated to, to, to design. And I, I, I don't have time to go into that, which is a shame because it's really interesting, but it's something the, the async working group has been um, discussing and, and thinking about. Either, like, I, and I'm hopeful that we will actually have an async drop um, implemented at some point. It's just not as easy as it sounds. But even if it were, um, or even if we did put all, all that effort in and got that kind of like soon, the more fundamental problem is that in Rust, destructors are not guaranteed to get run. So it's okay to rely on destructors running most of the time because most of the time they run. But in this case, we'd be relying on destructors for soundness, and that's not okay. This would um, because you can call mem forget. Um, or just destroy the memory by um, in other ways. Um, you you can't guarantee that the destructor is going to be run, and in those cases, you would still have this re, um, use after free error. So the, um, so unfortunately, calling drop whether that's async or synchronous is not uh, a solution. Um, we do have solutions though. The simplest is that um, the I/O library manages a buffer, and you just copy into the user's buffer. Um, and 
Um, although that's simple, which is good, um, it's also not very performant. And worse, it doesn't fit in with this idea of having precise control over the performance um, because the, the I library is managing the buffer and this copy is forced upon you. And really, like one of the main advantages of using completion IO is this idea of having zero copies. So that, that works, but it's not great. Um, a better approach is perhaps using the buff read trait. Now, we usually think of buff read in terms of having a buffer where we kind of collate multiple small reads before returning the whole thing. But that's not what's important here. What's important here is that that buffer is internal to the reader, right? Um, and in this case, that would mean the I.O. library can, can manage that buffer and then the, the caller can read that without that copy being forced upon them. Um, but this is, this is um, fine in a lot of cases, but sometimes you might want to um, re uh, read directly into the user's buffer, or you don't want the um, buffer to be managed by the I.O. library. And in this kind of case, we might need a new trait like owned read. And the idea here is we'd pass an owned buffer um, to the, to the I.O. library rather than a borrowed one. So imagine something like a vec of U8 rather than a borrowed slice of U8. Um, and so now the caller is responsible for the buffer management, and we just pass it for the, to the I.O. library so the I.O. Library, IO library can keep that buffer alive just for long enough for that call. So we're not exactly sure what the, 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 the eventual solution here is going to look like. Perhaps we'll have, um, support both of these traits, but we are confident that we'll have some kind of optimal way to support completion I.O. All right, I want to finish this talk off just to, to summarize um, what I've talked about in particular, where we're going and, and give you an idea of the kind of like shiny future we're heading towards, hopefully. So we want you to be able to write async anywhere you can write a function. So whether that's methods on traits, whether that's closures, whether that's destructors, we want um, async to be everywhere. And it shouldn't matter which runtime you use. There's always going to be like reasons for, for different users to want to use different runtimes, but you should still have access to the entire ecosystem and all the goodness of programming with, with asynchronous Rust. Okay? And in particular, if your requirements, your constraints change, it should be easy to change runtime too. And when you for somebody who's starting programming in asynchronous Rust, you should be able to get started without having to care about which runtime you use, without having to do that research into finding the right one for you and depending on a you know, great big um, runtime from the ecosystem. And um, once you've made your program, inevitably there are going to be bugs in it, and finding those using a debugger should be a great experience. In particular, it should be, you know, work just as well as using a, um, a debugger with synchronous Rust. And I haven't uh, had a chance to, to talk about uh, that much in this talk, um, but the, the ASIC working group has been doing work on that too, to, to, to work towards having a great debugging experience. And um, we want um, programming with async Rust uh, to be to be easier. We've been doing a lot of work thinking about um, the invariants, the guarantees that you should have when doing asynchronous programming, and especially around the life cycle of, um, of futures, like how they're started, how they end, whether they're cancelled. And um, we, we want to kind of like use that to, to um, uh, design libraries, perhaps in the ecosystem, perhaps in, in the standard library, and design uh, come up with design patterns um, which um, enable you to, 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 to write asynchronous Rust code more safely uh, and more easily. And to achieve all this, we need your help. So this is our, our call for contribution. And of course, there's a ton of work to be done. If you would like to contribute to the design work, to the implementation, documentation, testing, we would love you to help out. But in particular, um, even, if you're, even if you don't want to do that work, but you are using async Rust today, and especially if you are implementing a runtime, whether that's a general purpose runtime that's available for everyone, or whether that's specific to your project, um, and 
perhaps that's kind of like a um, closed source and so we don't know about it, then we really want to hear about your experiences and your um, opinions on the work we're doing so that we ensure that we're building the right thing um, to, uh, to, to help you continue to, to build um, asynchronous Rust programs and to do that kind of better. So uh, we, we work as much as we can in the open. We work do a lot of work on GitHub and the WG async uh, repo is a great place to start. For more synchronous communication, we use the Rustlang Zulip chat and then we have the WG async channel there where we communicate. So um, uh, please reach out to us in, in either of those places. Um, I'm Nick Cameron um, on Zulip, and I'm Nick underscore R Cameron on Twitter. And I'm going to be on disc on the the, the RustConf Discord. Well, right now, um, for uh, and for some time after the talk. So please reach out either on Discord or or Zulip or Twitter if there's anything in this talk you want to to talk about or that's interesting, or if you want to just follow along to see where this goes. Um, so that that's the end of the talk. Um, just. Thank you for, for listening. Cheers.